everyone. Richard Carlton here. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker Training. I'm here with Mr. Jacob Taylor, who's going to be assisting us today. We are very <laughs> excited to be here. So today is mostly for beginners and intermediates. So before I get into that, if you want to support the channel, you go to fmtrain.tv, you have the live training button, but purchase the bundle. We greatly appreciate it. If you purchase the bundle, I know that you love me, and it also helps me pay Nick's bills. Uh, so when Nick invoices me and puts his timesheets in, I can pay him. That would be really awesome. So pick one of the bundles. I would say Patreon, but we just do our own thing. We roll our own. We eat our own dog food. We don't need Patreon. We have FileMaker. It's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to pivot real quick to this slideshow. So I'm going to go through this as a slideshow real quick um, to help everyone out. But the, but the start of this conversation is essentially about SMTPS. So let me just bring this, fi this sample file up here real quick. This entire conversation is stupid. And why is it dumb? It's because back in 19... Uh, 76 or whatever it was when Star Wars first came out, uh, the DARPA people, the people who created the internet, were using the internet to send mails back and forth. It was a U.S. Department of Defense kind of thing. And so the contractors, Lawrence Livermore Labs, all these people building nukes and rockets and missiles and stuff were com communicating with U.S. government, right? That's where the internet came from. And so before Jacob was born, that's when it was. They sent emails back and forth along the way, as we all know, Bad people got a hold of email services and started spamming you, pretending to be you. We're going to address all this today, including some deflector shield technology and this stuff. But the idea was that back in the day when I first did the first email out of FileMaker, I actually sent an email to someone else from Steve Jobs at Apple.com, and it went through. And it looked legit and authentic. And I went, ooh, this is great power with great ability to be abused, right? And promptly, people with substantially less ethics than I have, I did it as a test. I thought it was funny. Then I realized it worked. And that was bad juju, right? And that was back when Steve was alive, right? So the idea is that you can send email out of FileMaker. We all know that's a super valuable capability. We're not talking about receiving email in today. We're talking about sending it out. This is a basic skill set. The command that we're going to talk about today um, you can do this with 360 Works email and some other things like that, but it's basically the send to email script step. It's right here. It's also up under FileMaker. If you go up under FileMaker and you say uh, send to records as uh, email or whatever it is, send to mail. It's a manual button that you can press. No one ever presses that. It's only in our world, we only script it and we control it when we script it. So if I press the button right here, this is where it's going to go to. It's a typically a to address, a from, a to from a subject, an email, and then for my purposes, we're attaching documents to this, like PDFs or those pictures and things that we're taking, we're talking about next week. So here is the rub. When you send out a FileMaker, historically, I would I would I try to put my hands over the bottom one here to block it, but <laughs> you all still see it. The top two here are the historical capabilities, sending it out to the local client or sending it out to the SMTP server. If you have a local email client on your computer or even a browser and you go to send a mail it's going to go you're communicating with an email server typically through smtp typically and that smtp is a protocol like if i say web or http or something like that it's a protocol the bits and bytes are organized in a specific way you don't have to worry about it all you have to know is that you're sending out through smtp this allows filemaker to directly send a mail to a email server then that email server ideally authenticates that you are who you are, and then it sends the email on your behalf across the internet to another email server that's closer to the recipient. And then that email hangs out there until the recipient retrieves the email. So it's from your client up to an email server, off to another email server to the recipient. So it's kind of like four computers are involved with this transaction at a very limited understanding, right? I'm sure it bounces more than that, but that doesn't matter. All we care about is us talking to the SMTP server and then really going to the end destination and it being received, it's accepted for uh, receiving. It's not bounced or rejected for some reason. So if you do email client and you send it out, you set this setting here, This that option disappears. When you send it, your local client computer is probably, especially on Windows, I did this on Windows 11 the other day, it throws up an alert saying, hey, FileMaker's trying to send an email and uh, we're going to get like a 10 second countdown and you have 10 seconds to abort this or it's going to work. So it doesn't reject it outright. Um, and I tried to figure out how to un, uh, turn off that blocking of it. 
But being Microsoft, they sent me to a page on the internet which didn't explain how to unblock it. So I was like, eh. So what happens is that you really want to bypass the operating system in your local email client. You can guarantee better results with your clients, with your customers, with your solution, better results, less hateful phone calls. Hey, Richard, this email thing, it worked really great while you're here, and now a week later, it doesn't work because you suck as a developer. The goal is to avoid that. Right, the goal, you don't want that kind of stuff happening. So we go directly to SMTP. We have these settings here. These settings, I'm going to pop these up real quick right here. So here is historically what we used to do. We would contact, if I buy internet from the company and it's AT&T fiber optic, I would go to AT&T. They would give me the SMTP settings. They would say, this is the name, the address of the server, like www.apple.com. That is the address of the server. The port number, which can be four or five or eight different kinds of ports that are used. Once again, I've explained this to junior people. If you don't know what a port number is, just imagine that you're that the internet is like radio. And to listen to the radio, you need to know what frequency to listen to. That's kind of the way at a very junior analogy, and it holds up pretty well, is that to listen on the radio, you just know, I'm listening to the radio, right? On a car, okay? FM, AM, whatever. You have to know the frequency. That's kind of the way the internet works. The traffic goes across the internet, but it's really dialed uh, with specific port numbers on it uh, from zero or one up to like 65,000. So that's the way uh, port numbers work on the internet. And email typically goes across four or five different ports for email. Internet is port, uh, web traffic is port 80. If it's encrypted internet or if it's browser traffic, it's port 80. If it's Encrypted browser traffic, it's port 443. FTP typically uses a port number. FileMaker typically uses 5003 as reserved for FileMaker, okay? But SMTP has a couple different ports. If you click on this, is it showing to me right there? It's not showing to me. It's elsewhere. You'll see a couple different things. But the port number is specific. So you have to know the, ser the destination e SMTP server. You have to know the port number, and you have to typically tell it whether you're encrypting it or not encrypting it, and if you're encrypting it, how. And then you have to specify that you have a plain password, none. All these are options you really need to know, okay? And then you have a username and password, okay? So historically, your your the company that provides internet access to you would would do this. And so this is SMTP out. The problem, and Jacob, if you want to jump in here a little bit, the problem is that people found ways of abusing even this. So, so when I sent an email to Steve Jobs before, um, that was before they even asked for this stuff. This was I sent that email in '96. I think 1996 when I sent that email. So the idea is that you would be provided this information from your internet provider. These days, the internet providers are trying to get away from SMTP. They're trying to do APIs with OAuth, which is a whole level of complexity that's typically much less fun for beginning and intermediate developers. And so the idea today is for us to find a service that is reliable, that we trust, so what are the services that are reliable that we trust? Right off the top, I love AWS, pretty reliable. They don't care about Macs. They don't care about Windows. They're kind of agnostic. I love that. Um, I like Twilio. But for example, uh, there's a service that we currently use that we're probably going to have to get away from at some point, and that was MailChimp. MailChimp had two parts of the company, Mandrill and MailChimp. MailChimp is this um, uh, end user facing uh, email service that helps you bombard people with emails, right? Um, but they're like not designed for necessarily brilliant technical programmer types. It's designed for people who are not programmers. That's what MailChimp is. Mandrill was their backend SMTP service. And they determined that man the, the folks that run that company determined that they just wanted to sell products to the end users. And so what they do is they quit supporting the SMTP, right? And or they don't want to promote it. They still support it, but they don't promote it, and eventually it probably goes away, right? If you watch Dropbox or Slack and these companies, they're trying to reinvent themselves. Somehow they're not successful enough and they want more money. And by them rummaging around and changing their formula, they run the risk of alienating people, pissing them off, and losing their existing customer base. I'm seeing it all the time in a bunch of companies. Well, I don't want to deal with that as a developer. So Amazon doesn't give it. And we're talking about Amazon. The, the server part, the technical part of the company, not the shopping part. Amazon doesn't give a about end users. They only cater and service developers, period. So I can trust that they're not going to throw me over the side of the ship. Twilio is the same way. So let's get into this slideshow here real quick. Uh, today's broadcast or today's conversation is for 
beginners and intermediate developers. And so let's talk about this real quick. Jacob is over there looking very bored. I'm sorry, Jacob. We did a recent survey, 93.2% of FileMaker projects require email to be sent out of a custom database, just the way it is. SMTP has been the traditional method of sending these emails, right? The OAuth and API is kind of a semi new thing. And so uh, the problem is OAuth and APIs and stuff, they're not for for a brand new developer or intermediate developer or someone that hasn't doesn't have experience doing API and insert from URL and curl and postman and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's a little harder, right? So that's always a pain. So this is a screenshot of what you just saw. The SMTP option is still a viable option, but you have to have a service that will support it and a service that's going to be reliable and professional, okay? That's why I, did, uh, I was digging around and I found that Twilio, which doesn't really support end users, they support the de developer community like, uh, like uh, Amazon. Um, they had this SMS service, they had some other services. Some, Jacob, did they buy SendGrid? Is that what they did? They bought that from another yep. company? Okay. Yep. They were so they, so, so Twilio is becoming more of this serious service provider and they've been very reliable. They're not always trying to reinvent themselves. Like, oh, we're gonna change this and change this and change the name and do this. Even the word SendGrid, not the most descriptive great name, but as a professional developer, I'm gonna start to see that. This is SendGrid. So it's an additional product or service provided by Twilio. Twilio, in my mind, has historically done SMS messaging. So you can send text messages, right? In FileMaker, right? Ten set text messages on your phone. Beep, beep, beep. Your invoice is paid. Beep, beep, beep. This and that and the other thing. Okay. Now I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to go to the next slide. So what we're going to do is I'm going to I, I'm going to walk you through the setup process on this. Um, and there's a couple, not really caveats, but I, I will save some time for you if you've not done this before with SynGrid. Most of you haven't. This will save you a little bit of time. So basic, you're going to create an account. It's a free account. SynGrid is free from Twilio if you send less than 100 emails a day. Right. So that gives you plenty of, of, of space to test. And even a couple of customers they have that send five or 10 emails a day, they'll never graduate to a paid level. But if they if they do, they want to grow up. This has the back end to support. It has the infrastructure to support it. So the process, you're going to go through this. So Twilio is very big on 2FA. In fact, I'd almost call it 3FA. Right. Uh, they're going to validate a username and password. They're going to validate typically you with email initially during the setup. They're also going to validate you on your phone. A lot of people send a code to your SMS, but they use an app uh, called Authy. We will show you a screenshot of that real quick. Um, it's kind of interesting for those of you who haven't seen it. It's the idea of a, kind of like these RSA tokens that used to count down the code changes every 20 seconds or something with a little RSA tokens. You ever seen that? It's that kind of deal. So. Uh, so what it is, as you sign up, they're going to say, hey, you can authenticate via SMS or Authy. I did Authy just for <laughs> and giggles to try it out. Authy is kind of this, I don't want to say open source, but it's kind of this uh, authenticator app that runs on your mobile device that uh, can support multiple different companies, right? And so right here, this is a screenshot I took earlier, and you're like, that's a secret password. Okay, that secret password was only good for 16 seconds back about an hour ago right and so after 16 seconds this thing counts down counts down and that number gets changed so the numbers are changing on my Authy app at the same time they're changing on the receiving side and they somehow keep synced up i have no idea how they do that it sounds like black magic to me or some sort of weird shit, but it works right so the idea is that you get a code and you write the code down on a piece of post-it note that code you better hustle because you have to put this password in and hit return before the 16 seconds are up or you have to start all over right and these are the different services here gemini is a cryptocurrency thing you got twitch uh signature loyal has to do with uh, helicopters and jet fuel at airports and whatever so i guess these are apps that you could click on it and they will give you this rotating code pretty neat um moving on so then we set up, so now you're authenticated, you have an email set up, you have your phone set up, you have an account set up. And so what you have to do is create a sender identity, a single sender identity. All this is is, is a person, i.e. in my case, I consider the person to be FileMaker, okay? FileMaker, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this for a FileMaker. So what I do is I set, go through a process, you're gonna put the name, person's name, email address, they're gonna verify that they have a email that works at the same domain. So this happens to be Big Valley Aviation. 
and they confirm with this person that he's a real person there, hit the email to confirm. So then you get this point where it says verified, there's a little X here, it's not verified yet. After you confirm the email, it turns to a green check. So you've set up an account, it's a free account, you set up a single, a single sender verification, which also implies you can authorize more than one person, right? To send mails on this through this account, right? Pretty great, but I'm just using one for today. We get it approved over here. Then the next step is to go through the process of connecting your application, your Oracle application, SQL, whatever, in our case, we're using FileMaker application to send mail out. Your two choices are Web API, which is great. If you can do Node.js, Ruby, C++, some of you are, are this group, this is your senior engineers. This is what you use for people like myself who are beginning or intermediate developers. I'm kind of this weird intermediate developer, but also senior developer, but I don't have the hours I sit and code endlessly, so I try to hang out in this intermediate area. For me, SMTP is a hell of a lot simpler to set up, period. I think it's much easier to set up. Next step on that, you're going to set up an API key. It's going to say create the key. So, I, so what I did is I clicked over the SMTP uh, relay. Um, and the idea is that they're going to be, when you send the email out of FileMaker, you're going to talk directly to SendGrid, as, and they will relay your SMTP traffic out to the internet. But before you do that, you have to authenticate a basically a username and password. So if you remember the SMTP settings at the bottom was a username and password, we have to set that up. So we put a name in here. It doesn't matter what this name is. This is for your reference. And then here are the settings you have to write down. You've got to write this down. That's the name of the server, the listening server on their side. These are the three ports, 25, 587, 465. And obviously these two here work for unencrypted or TLS. TLS is a kind of encryption, okay? And then 465 is SSL encryption, which is a little bit older encryption, I think, for the most part. TLS, Jacob, isn't that the newer stuff? Yep, correct. Okay. Cool. And now here's here. Now I wasted hours getting my stuff set up twice. And I had two different problems that I ran into. One of which was that whenever you have, typically when you set up SMTP someplace, you will use your username and password for your email account. So typically your username is the name of the person or the person. So it'd be richard.carlton at rcconsulting.com or Ken underscore art at hotairballoons.net or whatever he would have for that. That would be your username. In the case of send grid, the username will always, will always, will always be API key lowercase one word. It never changes to anything else. I and I when I was setting it up, I kept using that as username because to me the username was always a dynamic changing thing like the password right i mean you you set it up and then it stays but the idea is that it's not universal for everyone everyone who buys SendGrid or gets SendGrid, every last person's username is api key down here when you go through the process you, you click this and you hit create it's going to change the password into a uuid code a uuid is big long string we've talked about that before super uh random and so that they're not really worried about everyone having the same username that api key is a long string okay and you're going to write that down now here's the thing with that they will only show it to you the way like amazon works whenever you set up an amazon server you have this key pair it's a username and password and you, when you set up an account on amazon you have to save that key pair as a little text file you write it down whatever you need to do because once they give it to you once, they will never give it to you again. It's a security measure. You can never go back and say, oh, I forgot what it is. Give it to me. No, you have to delete it and put it back in. And so you have to go in here and authenticate and put it back in. So they're going to, on the next screen, which I don't think I'm showing to you, they, they, they have the same information here. And then they put this string in here and they say, write it down, write it down, or you can click it, copy it, put it in a text file. So so mistake that cost me an hour, number one, was that I, I was using this up here for my username, which would never work because it's always this. The second item was was that I took a screenshot of, of, the, of the next screen with the password on it. And Jacob knows about this. He's laughing at me. And what happens is, is that it, these days, if you open, if I take a screenshot, I'm going to just, for fun, I'm going to take a screenshot of this right here, okay? 
And then we're going to go over here to the mm -hmm. Apple Mac operating system over here. We're in the Mac, but I think it's the same mostly on Windows. If not, sooner or later, Windows will copy it, okay? This is a image. This is a screenshot. Nothing in this document is text. This is a picture, right? We all understand that concept. However, with the newer computers now, if we click on stuff, you can highlight it. It acts like it's a text file. It's doing optical character recognition, which means it's using some level of smart AI algorithm or whatever to figure out what the text is. Well, if you have this long string, A131, IIIL513, the problem was is that I came to my screenshot and said, ah, there's the key. I highlighted it, copied it. The OCR got it wrong because a capital I and a lowercase L, depending upon the font, looked the same, and it was screwing up. So I, I couldn't figure out why I was so stupid and why SMTP wouldn't work. And Jacob goes, oh, yeah, Richard, did you write it down? I said, yeah, I've got a screenshot and I copy it right here. And he goes, that can cause problems. I've had, he's seen that before other places, right? I couldn't go back and get it because they only shows it to you once. I'm like, Shh. so delete the API, put it in again. This time when it pops up at the bottom, I like click on it and it says copied into the clipboard like officially you're copying the actual string of text save it guess what it magically works so those are the two snags that i ran into right pretty straightforward um, there's one other snag but we're going to get into that here momentarily but those are the obvious like stupid snags so i'm trying to help everyone here by so if you have a password and it's a screenshot and you kind of select it like this and copy it like this is pretty easy right here if i grab this line but if you have a bunch of random characters and the big I's and little L's or O's and zeros and things don't look the same. They look, well, they look very similar depending on the font. That's why I always, these days, whenever I have that kind of stuff going on, a zero, I like to put the slash to the zero. I like a font with a, as an engineer, a Z with a little line in the middle or a zero with a slash to it. You do some things so you know, really, you don't get the characters mixed up. So that's this. So this is all pretty straightforward. For, for <laughs> and giggles, I'm going to just run this script so you can see it. Um, all the script does, it sends, and that's the error condition comes back. Error zero means the email went out successfully. That was it. There's absolutely, the whole point of this is really boring. This whole conversation sucks because after 25, 30 years, we should not be having the same conversation again about trying to beat ourselves getting email to work. Email should just work. But because of all the security stuff comes up, it's hard to get it set up sometimes. So, the, so you put all those settings that you had, including the uh, down there at the bottom, you're going to put that. Uh, UUID string in that they give you, right? And then this works, right? Um, it's all great. So that's kind of how that was. You saw it work. So let's talk about the next part of this. The thing is that this is this. It's like what I had. I had this conversation with Claris. Um, I said, is, everyone watches this movie called The Field of Dreams. It's a wonderful movie. It's very inspirational. I think it was Kevin Costner. I think he was in that. And he kept hearing these voices, if you build it, they will come. So he builds this baseball field out in the middle of his cornfield and, and basically bankrupts himself doing it, okay? And if they build it, then all these people show up and give him money, okay? It makes for a good movie, but it's bullshit. If you send an email out, it will be delivered. No, okay? Maybe, maybe not, right? And most of the time, no. So, Jacob, this is where we get into the conversation here. But basically, you send the email to the destination the destination is going to do certain things to make sure that I am not Steve Jobs at Apple.com. I remember that conversation. Well, now they've got sufficient protective technology in place to make sure that I am truly Steve Jobs at Apple, which is would be something, right? But if I'm Tim Cook at Apple, right? He's there. He should have an active email account, right? We don't want to pretend I'm Tim Cook. So this technology prevents you from doing that. The technical fire, FileMaker side is done. Now we're into the side where we're talking about setting up a sender policy framework or a DKIM. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next slide. So, Jacob, you want to walk us, start walking us through this, what SPF records are. And the next slide is just a screenshot of the D. DKIM, yeah, domain keys are the, that's the two first letters. That's how I remember it. Okay, um, so here we go. So you're up yeah. at the top now. Here we go. So, yeah, so the very short version of this is, so, like, I can use RCC as an example. I'm not going to explain what SPF is. I'll, I'll give me 10 seconds, basically. So I'm Jacob. I want to make sure no one can send email as me, right? And Richard's early example is sending as Steve Jobs. Uh, that would be improbable these days uh, due to Steve Jobs no longer being with us. But uh, but maybe he wants to masquerade as me. Um, there's uh, email alone, none of these other things involved, you can just do that. You can put anybody's, two things, anybody's name, anybody's email, 
on your email as the sender. There's nothing that prevents that. It's literally like a text box or, you know, like you could just type it in, whatever you want. Good to go. However, the whole point of this is that you probably don't want that to happen. For example, we don't want people masquerading as Richard. You don't want people masquerading as me. And so we've added a few things to the ecosystem of email that is not merely FileMaker talks to a server, the server relays the email to its destination. Uh, SPF is one of those things. What it is, SPF stands for Sender Policy Framework. Um, and really what that is, is a list of uh, either email addresses, email servers, IP addresses, uh, things like that, that are allowed to send uh, on behalf of your domain. Like, again, we're talking about masquerading. You can put anybody's you know, return address on the label. We're going to list out who is allowed to do that, right? That's what SPF does. So in RCC's case, for example, uh, we use Gmail for our like actual email addresses. And then as previously you want, noted, you want me, I have a screenshot of that uh, of ours, of the of the Gandhi screenshot that of the Gandhi one. Sure. Yeah, we, we want me to go to that, that right now. Let me do sure. that. Yeah, that's okay. an easy one. Basically, what it is, is is we are listing out who can send as us. And so where's your there it is. Would you can you highlight the SPF line? So people know which one they're looking for. One yeah, one. that one. Thank you. Um, so that uh, with the little orange line here. So um, this is DNS, essentially our domain, which is why this is done in DNS, um, can announce who is allowed to send in us. Now, like I said, we use Gmail for like mail clients and phones and things. Um, but like our email list and a few other things at RCC go out through Mandrel. Um, we use that service. And so you can see on this line, there's basically a couple of things that are called out specifically, one of which is Mandrel, that's the first one, and then the second one is Google. Um, and you can see the, actually the Google and the Mandrel ones both have an SPF uh, subdomain in them, and it's so that it's to make this easier, basically. Um, they have, a, they have a, a DNS entry on their domain that says, uh, I'm Google, uh, here are the IP addresses of all of my email servers, specifically Gmail servers. Why don't you back up and explain where this text file comes from and who owns this text file and, and that yeah. this is not secret, right? So yeah. let's go back to D buying a domain. I'm going to buy www.rcconsulting.com from Gandhi or from register.com or from anyone. Okay. And when you buy that, yep. Name they, might, daddy, whoever. Yep. they yep. might obscure this from you, but at the end of the day, they manage and maintain this on your behalf. Um, in our case with Gandhi, we can log in and mess with this. So this is all the stuff about, is this RC Consulting or is this? It is. Yep. I guess it is. So this is all RC Consulting right here. And so an A record tells people, what is an A record? Is that where the web server is? Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a legit address. So if someone types WW, everybody always wonder why if you type RC Consulting or Apple.com, it actually, the computer's really at the end of the day, are not apple.com, et cetera. They don't give it, they all operate on an IP address. So it, what this does, it translates apple.com or rcconsult.com to an IP. Then that allows your browser to go hunt for this IP. So we, the first thing that happens is that when you type this in a browser, it goes to, to uh, D, this catalog of where these things are at for all the companies. And it looks up where RC Consulting is, it's here. Then it says, okay, so now I'm gonna go hunt for 54-219-129-247. And so there, so that's the first step before you ever start mm -hmm. loading anything on a browser. And so what else operates at rcconsulting.com? Mail. So a record, this is called a record. These are records like a database. Remember, a record in Excel is a row, right? So that's the analogy here. So there's a row there, kind of like an Excel. This is a text file, effectively. Okay, there's a record oh. there, a record there. MX is email, right? Yep, mail exchange. So it tells you that if you're going trying to send mail to RC Consulting, you're going to go here to get it. Okay, makes sense. And these are a bunch of MX records because I think Google has backup mail servers and all that kind of crap. And so Google yep. probably told you, Jacob, to type this shit in, right? Is that what they said here? They gave you a little list, type this stuff in? There's a there's a big official page that's like, here's all the records you need. Here's If you want to have multiple like we have, here's all the extras. Yep. Yep. So then I'm not sure what this one is, but we get down to this, these other ones here. Jacob could, but I don't want to get into this conversation too much deeper. But the SPF here, so so what happened is 
I before I ever had this conversation with Jacob about a week ago, I set up the send grid with FileMaker. It sends to the customer. The customer goes, I didn't get the email. And I'm like, well, FileMaker says error zero, which means it worked. So it went up to the relay and then it disappeared into the internet. So we start hunting around. It's on the in it's on the customer's computer in their spam folder. And I'm like, well, sh at least it made it, but then it wrote, did it as spam. So how do we fix that? And so then Jacob goes, well, we have to do this SPF thing, right? Which is how we're here. So we've explained to you that you have to create this entry. So for whatever domain you're sending uh, from you. So basically you have to bless SendGrid as an authorized sender for your domain. So if yeah. it's RC Consulting, I don't own SendGrid, but I'm gonna have an account with them. I have to authorize SendGrid to send email on my behalf, like my representative. And to do that, I loaded it in here. Yeah, and and that was 100%. That was what Richard was running into um, with that client is they actually had an SPF record already, uh, but they use, uh, I don't know, hosted Microsoft 365 or something yeah. like that. Yeah, 365. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's fine, whatever. Um, but it... We didn't have the entry for SendGrid uh, in the SPF record. And so when he sent the email, uh, out, uh, Outlook in this case, uh, checked and said, oh, SendGrid isn't on the list to send as BVA. Right. And so, so it spammed so, it. It didn't reject so, it. It didn't kick it out. It didn't delete it, but it put it in the spam bin. So this is, is RC know. Consulting right here. This is RC Consulting. And the of you are going, well, how come e SendGrid isn't in here? Because we took a screenshot of one. If I use SendGrid right now, if I use SendGrid right now to send an email on behalf of RC Consulting, this is a screenshot here, then the, the recipients on the internet are going to come into this record and go, who can send emails on behalf of RC Consulting? Okay, Google can check, Mandrill check, that, uh, or Mandrill. They're the ones that do my email campaigns, right? You guys get our emails, right? But there's no SendGrid on here. Oh, SendGrid sent the email. <laughs> So they're not authorized, put them in spam. So right now, if I use RCC with SendGrid, it's going to go into spam. We would have to add either another line on here or append it to this line somehow, right? Whatever that syntax. We would, we would edit the, yeah, you'd edit the entry basically to add. Stu, um, Stu says without an SPF record, Gmail won't even deliver to the spam folder and sometimes will reject it. I think you can have only one yeah. A one SPF record, right? It's an interesting conversation. Some of you know a great deal about this, and some of you have never heard of this. I knew that this was a thing. I didn't know it was called SPF, so that's Sender Policy Framework, right? Framework. Framework. So I want to make sure we ask, answer, and ask questions about this right now. Question uh, from Stu says, to clarify, does sending the email address need to be a real account, or can you use a dummy email address like unmonitor or something detailed at RC Consulting. So does it have to, is it validating that it's a real account? I said, yes, uh, it's not because it could, you know, the, you could relay that to like a real email account. Um, I, however, would not. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you were trying to, what you're doing is validating the email account as the account that you can send as, that you can masquerade as using SendGrid. And so, for example, uh, unless you are going to have a no reply at or, you know, something similar, right, where it's very obvious to a user and maybe with a note in the email that replies are not looked at, we don't, you know, we're not paying attention to this, then don't is the short version. Because if people reply back, if you get, you know, reports or complaints or just someone's, I don't know, they're checking their invoice, whatever the actual thing is that you're doing with email, those are going to go to a place that doesn't exist. Um, and other email servers, for example, can connect to, uh, I guess we'll use Gmail in the example, um, and ask, does, in this case, unmonitored email at RC Consulting, like, does that account exist? Gmail will say no, because there's no email account with that. There's no alias with it, et cetera. And so it, it's going to check uh, a very minor side thing, but for example, Richard, we validate emails that people submit to us that come into our systems. You could download FMSP, for example, that checks with a third-party service to see if that email yep. is valid. One of the things that company does, if they haven't seen an email before, is you connect to the mail server, somebody's email at whatever their domain is .com. They're going to connect to the, the email server for that domain and ask, does somebody's email exist as an account on this domain? And if the email server says no, I'm not allowed to use my middle finger here, but you know, 
<laughs> I can help with that if you want. But yeah, no, it's going to reject. So you probably should have a real email account. Um, uh, so I'm gonna. There's a couple comments here. I want to. If you folks have comments, YouTube, Twitch, Discord, let us know. Andy says Google also cries when you don't have a PTR record, and he's laughing. And I'm not sure if that's a joke or I don't know what a PTR record is. No, it's true. Is it? Okay. Is yep. that relevant to email or is that something? It's not strictly speaking, but uh, they do actually cry. It's. It is a. So what? What? The 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 three steps back conversation here is. Email isn't secure in any sense of that phrase, and we are adding things to try and improve the situation or make it more difficult, generally speaking, more expensive, et cetera, to do f***y things, <laughs> technical terms. To read um, emails, yeah. So Yeah, uh, which to, to masquerade up, as people you're not supposed to. Yeah, so then Lynn from Austin asked a really good question. Can people at SendGrid read your confidential emails? Absolutely, 100%, yes. Uh, if you are not using an email encryption system, a uh, PGP is the only one I know of that exists. Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Email is not encrypted, period. It may be encrypted in transit. It may be encrypted when it's being you know, relayed from SendGrid to Gmail or whoever you're sending it to. That's cool. Um, but the actual contents of the email are not encrypted, obscured, messed with, et cetera, et cetera. So none of that. No. Yeah. So it's to it's totally wide open. You, you, I, most people think of email as like a, you know, they treat it like instant messaging these days because it's fast enough to do that. I That's wonderful, actually. Um, but it's it's not confidential, private, et cetera, et cetera, it's in, in none of that, no. Um, there is a, uh, for example, if you use Gmail, there's like a confidential mode, I think Outlook. There's some third-party service providers that do different things that are kind of on that same thing to try and make a, you know, to make an encrypted thing or a confidential mode like that, where correct, the email provider cannot read your email. Um, those are like usually feature specific and email provider specific. Um, so like Gmail's confidential mode only works if you're emailing from Gmail to Gmail. Uh, if you're emailing to Outlook or to somebody else. Mm -mm. There's a question here and it came up and it's a good question. How is SendGrid different than Amazon SES? So Amazon SES, I like Amazon a lot, right? I also like Twilio a lot for the same reason. Large, reliable, they're not going to light my shit on fire and I don't have to worry about them doing some, the marketing department doing something stupid in the middle of the night, right? This is a simple mail service, the same kind of idea. The issue with this is that I don't think, I don't know, but I don't think they support SMTP Relay. SMTP Relay is like those four or five fields that you saw in the screenshot there's no API, there's no curl, there's no Postman, there's none of that other stuff. If you're a senior developer, like a bunch of you are here, then you can choose whichever service you want to use. I asked Jesse Barnum about this yesterday, actually before the live stream, because I told him I was going to talk about it. And he and he likes Amazon SES. And I, he goes, well, whenever you start Amazon SES out, it always starts in a sandbox mode, which means that you can send mails to yourself, but it won't really relay them or forward them. I'm not going to use the word relay, forward them out on your behalf like you would expect. You have to send an email or some sort of message to Amazon where you certify on a stack of Bibles that you are not a bad person and you will uphold the 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 Boy Scouts Honor Code of America, blah, 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 and not do bad <laughs> with your email. And then they turn it on so you can send it out publicly. I can tell you that when dealing with Twilio, um, and I can log on to here. It's got some really nice charts and graphs of what you're using. I think the interface is easier than Amazon's interface. But remember, Amazon's interface is designed with hundreds and hundreds of services. Just one of the services happens to be EC2, which is our virtual server stuff we use for FileMaker servers, right? Yep. And so SES is another service. Amazon's great. They're highly reliable. Hell, Twilio probably rides on top of Amazon, if I had to guess. Right. Uh, half the planet rides on top of it. Whenever Amazon has an outage, only about 50 other Fortune 100 companies have problems. Right. So cost wise, they're both pretty inexpensive. Uh, it becomes an issue when you start sending, I don't know, millions of emails. If you're a real hat spammer, then you might want to consider the pricing options. But yeah, right. Amazon has good pricing, but the, the setup is uh, more basically more formidable. It's less smooth. Um, I, I've walked several of our engineers through it and after the first time they can do it basically like it's fine but the very first time you go through you're like what because you have to like submit to Amazon to a human that reviews it on the back end uh, kind of uh, an outline of what your emails are what you're sending and like the nature of them and also a, uh, some minor examples um, 
And so they'll look at that and you'll be like, cool, we're not spammers because we're like sending transactional business email, which is very normal. Um, and that, and so you'll get approved. It's fine. But like it has to go through that and you're waiting for them to get back to you. There's no like, you know, with SendGrid, you go, you submit, you sign up next. Good to go. So. Yeah. Ken says, I agree. The submission was an issue for me. I had to do it a couple of times to get approval. Yeah. So um, yep. I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing for me. I'm not worried about getting approved. I'm more concerned about just the API part of it um, because I don't live in that world. Like Stu and some of you folks in here, really top level ninja, <laughs> right? Um, and you love doing the curl postman kind of stuff. For me, it, it's I don't have a high degree of comfort with that. I'm more comfortable with the monkey bread software, for example, which is saying something. For me, I would rather stay with SMTP Relay, uh, especially since there's a professional company here, multiple professional companies. But Twilio, I consider at the top of my list of people I trust, right? Do you think Syngrin would be a replacement for something like MailChimp or Constant Contact for fancy HTMLs aside from integrating with FMP? So let's talk about HTML emails real quick. This came up the other day, and Claris keeps saying no. How many times can Claris say no in a, in a row? It was poor Rick Kalman had to say it. I felt bad for him. There are no native HTML, HTML emails that go out of FileMaker without some sort of crazy extra effort. If you have an HTML email, like I send HTML email out to people about, like, tomorrow we're going to send a campaign out to everyone and remind them what we covered yesterday with Jesse Barnum on MirrorSync, really great, uh, and the recording and everything for that. We do that through 360 Works email plugins. You have to use a plugin to really concoct a nice HTML email, so one, you've got that part of it. Then, once you're going to send it, it doesn't matter what service you send it, it the, com the conversation is the same. With Big Valley Aviation, I'm sending a te plain text email with attachment PDFs and images and things like that. If I want to do, and that's natively out of FileMaker, if I want to do HTML emails that are all fancy and pretty, then they're going to have to pay to go back and rejigger that email sending so the PDFs are still there at the bottom, but it has a, the beaut beautification with the HTML in there, right? That's not really specific per se. Um, that's me doing HTML emails out of FileMaker. It's the way we roll. If you go to MailChimp or Constant Contact, they have templates. So you can have them create the email template for you and send it out. So you're just, as an end user, subscribing, going to them, right? Does that make sense? Subscribing, going to them, and they're sending that HTML out. They're formulating it for you and sending it out on your behalf. You might upload to them a list of people that need the email, that's kind of like the old uploaded Excel spreadsheet. We'll send this email to everyone, right? Whatever. So uh, those are really two different things, right? If that makes sense. Someone, that's what these companies try to do. That's what happened with MailChimp and Mandrill. Mandrill was the back-end relay service that the developers needed. MailChimp was the front end, which is kind of for end users who really not really people in this group. People in this group can go build sophisticated email systems. Uh, constant contact is for people who can't or don't want to deal with that, right? They, 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 their, their idea of a good time is Excel. And then if you want to do fancy HTML emails, you might pay a service to do that. In my case, we wrote FileMaker to do that for us. So yeah, that's what Constant Contact, I'm not sure what they use for their backend, but I think MailChimp and Mandrill are two different companies and one bought the other one or whatever, and they glued them together. Because what they're trying to do is all these sales and marketing people, they can only make so much money building stuff for developers unless you're like Amazon or Twil uh, Twilio, which case you're like a, a dominant force in the market, right? And then you get a lot of business. But, you know, it's like even like certain companies that make FileMaker, they would love to cut the – in an ideal world, they and I know this, trust me, they would love to sell products direct to the customer, right? Because they, because the management team there knows and understands kind of what that looks like, except that that's not fundamentally what the platform is, right? If Amazon EC2 can, and, and they came out, we're going to do EC, we're going to we're going to go out to end customers and and sell servers to them. I mean, <laughs> what kind of conversation would that be? That'd be like Amazon trying to do. Do do you need a server? And most people, if you ask them what a server is, they they might be able to answer it for you. You ask them what an IP address is, no concept. Ask them what a port number is, no concept. So some things in the world are very technical, as we all know. Some things are uh, floofy front end for end users, right? Um, you know, are, are you the mechanic that can work on a car? Are you the person that, you know, it's like the I saw the video the other day of the lady who was trying to put gasoline in a Tesla, and she kept trying to jam the gas nozzle into the charging port of the Tesla. She did not blow herself up. I was waiting for that. 
if you're if you're that kind of person, a you shouldn't be watching this live stream, and b good good luck, right? Anyway, so I don't have much more Friday. That's good. Hopefully, you folks are having a good time with this. If you have questions, comments, feedback, let us know. Um, I'm bringing these things to you because I think they're relevant to beginning and intermediate. And then along the way, the SPF thing came into here and the full B. Did, Jacob, do we want to talk about the DYMK real quick? DKIM, right. yeah. Yeah. So at first there's SPF, and then there's this one. This one yep. you don't have to really deal with, but why don't you just frame it for people so they understand what yeah, when you send an email, let's stick with our example of uh, Google as one of the options and SendGrid as one of the other options. So it doesn't matter which one we're talking about here. When you send an email through Google or SendGrid, uh, they sign your email. Like crypt this is a cryptography conversation. You know, it's, it's signing your letter or signing your name on a contract, this sort of thing, right? So they sign your email. And what that means is, uh, they have validated you, whoever you are, talked to Google. And Google went, great, we've received the email. They put their little signature on it. It's not yours, it's theirs. Um, and then they relay the email wherever it's going, right? You sent it. So when that email arrives at its destination, that server looks and goes, ah, there's a signature on it. Fantastic. And that email receiver can then look at your domain. In this case, maybe we'll use RC Consulting for the... Uh, uh, for our example, and so uh, I'll send uh, I'll send BVA an email from mine, right? Okay, uh, as the example, so we've sent it. BVA's email server is in the process of receiving this email. It looks at rcconsulting.com and says, ah, it's it's got a signature. It came from Google. Uh, it, it did the SPF checks. We talked about those, right? It looks and says, ah, Google's on the list. Google sent it. Google's on the list. Jacob's good to go. All right, cool. Second check, DKIM. It looks, says, ah, Google signed the email. Fantastic. Or there's a signature on the email. Who knows at this point whose it is? Google signed the email. It looks, it looks at our domain. It says, ah, there's a DKIM entry. I'm going to ignore what that is, but it's a, again, it's another one of these DNS entries, DNS records. It looks at it. Yep. And there's a, we have, uh, it's actually not in the screenshot, I don't think. So in any case, is, is another record in your DNS and it's got a, special format basically but all of those things aside uh, it looks at that and looks at the email it just received and that entry that you have posted in this case maybe you didn't but if you've posted this entry this dkim dns record it it can compare the two and say ah one that's you know some signature on the domain rc consulting has published this thing this string that says ah this is who is signing our emails or this is one of the options for who is signing our emails check the email signature thumbs up thumbs down right it, if you did it correctly or you know it's 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 somebody from saudi arabia is emailing as me the email signature on their email is not going to match cuz it's not the one that we published to say this is who is signing our emails Right. So that doesn't mean anything like yes or no. This is a, this is a technical determination that we're talking about right here, but it is a factor. And that factor is you might be spam binned based on those two things, either being different there that you've announced a key. Someone else has sent an email, compared it. It failed. It's not the right key. Right. Someone else is. Uh, pretending to be you in this case, basically. Um, and so they it'll look at that and go, ah, that's fake or someone else did it or, or it's invalid or like whatever. Um, and that can mean spam bin. That can mean you got rejected. Uh, it can mean, you know, it gets put off to the side and gets one of those, if you've ever seen in Gmail, the big yellow bars. We don't know who this email came from. Concern, concern, you know, it's Google's concerned look <laughs> in a dialogue right, right. form. Um, this is weird. There's something wrong with this. We're not, you know, it doesn't look horrifying. We don't see malware, but like something's off. Uh, and basically, yeah. And so if you have a bunch of different things that say there's something wrong with this email, that can be a reason it goes into the spam bin. Um, with the subsequent, the thing that comes after both SPF and DKIM, which is called DMARC, we're going to basically gloss over that today, but um, you can tell Google or the receiving email place what to do with that information. And so you can say uh, it passed SPF, but it failed DKIM, right? So it's an authorized sender, but something's wrong with it. It was signed by the wrong entity. There's something messed up about it. You can say, do we want to do nothing? 
Do I want to quarantine the email, which is essentially putting it in the spam bin, or you can actually mark it as reject. And so, for example, if today, and this is actually true currently, um, if you wanted to pretend to be Richard, right? We're going to send as Richard Carlton and RC Consulting. Okay. Uh, you set, you put all your fake email in there, do all the stuff. You send it through, I don't know, SendGrid, Amazon, somebody, uh, somebody that you get to allow you to do that. Whoever receives that email will look at RC Consulting domain. It'll check the SPF. It'll check the DKIM. It'll check the DMARC. It'll go, ah, 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 something's wrong. And it'll throw it in the trash bin because it knows based on all the little details that we've just outlined, it's probably not Richard sending the email. And so we can tell it, what do you want to do with that? Uh, spam bin it, right? Okay, cool. Um, or throw it in the trash. Literally, you can have it reject it, where if it doesn't pass all the little checks, it just it dumps the email on the floor. Um, that would be, we'll call that the most secure. Obviously, if you're sending emails to clients, you probably have some concern about deliverability and you don't want to be just chucking stuff in the trash randomly. Um, but if someone's trying to impersonate your CEO, that could be very important. So yeah. um, it's it it's it's difficult to like talk about the business implications of that because it will entirely depend on like what you're using email for. So if it is like an executive email and they're, you know, it's it's the classic example the email or the the, the CEO emails the finance director to transfer twenty five thousand dollars into, you know, uh, one of these situations, you probably want to make sure the CEO is the one that actually sent that email. Ah, not Ken. Not Ken. Ken should not send that email. So yeah, so there's various levels of this uh, email certification to keep it from going into the dump. But I think we we saw most of our problems just with the SPF record, at least. With yeah, it. that if everything's lined up there, SPF for the most part will keep you out of the spam bin. It may not, you know, not always. And and with certain, I'll say email providers, I'm not talking about Google or something like that necessarily. Um, there's a lot of companies that run their own email. There's a lot of, oh, what's one of the, like, like different spam check services. Barracuda is a big one I've heard oh, in yeah. the past. Um, I, but, you know, providers like that, they do all the little checks, even if you haven't asked them to. And so like SPF will work for probably for most of your customers and essentially solves the problem. But depending on your customer base, your industry and things like that, how seriously, how hardcore they take email security, it, it may not be enough as a short version. So um, it's, you, and you'll hear about it. There's ways to sign up for like the screaming back that the servers do. You know, you've sent the email, it's it's not correct, some, something wrong with it. Um, you can have the receiving email server yell back and say, yo, there was a problem here. Like here's my little technical report about what the issue is. And, you can do stuff with that too. Um, I'll just ignore what all the details of that, but it, it's a thing that you can do if you're trying to figure out where your email's at and who's receiving it or not and stuff like that. Okay, so as a reminder, next Thursday, we have the schedule change. It'll be, in fact, Jacob will be here. It's gonna be the Underhood recap. So Clarice will be doing, if you haven't signed up for it, they have a, a, an event coming up on Tuesday um and clay mack will be doing that and then we've invited him we'll see if he wants to show up on thursday christian schmidt and anyone who's here senior developer if you want to chime in and talk about this a little bit but we'll be going through the implications of some of the under the hood stuff normally under the hood stuff has to do with if you use this feature in a certain way it will go fast or it might go slow or whatever right it's kind of largely under the hood means performance conversation really is where it really all goes I mean, we could say a lot of stuff about it, but uh, at the end of the day, a vast majority of when you say under the hood, people have, they want it to go faster under the hood. Knowing how things work under the hood allows you to to make things go faster. Nick talks about that quite a bit, right? So cool. Yeah, Claire's event is uh, Tuesday, right? So you can go to their website and find about it. It's on their website if you go to claris.com. Yeah, it's on the forums, I think. It's, you have to go to the- Maybe conference. it's not partner then. Yeah, they, they're- they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to put everything on the forums lately, which is like awesome because it's all in one place. And so I see the, you know, I see the logic for it. Also, if you have not signed up for the forum emails, uh, good luck. You will hear about nothing Claris does. At so. least from, from them. From me, you're good. I got you covered. Yep. We'll tell you. <laughs> we'll tell you. It's all good. Yeah. You don't want to do this unless you want to put a, mm, a metallic device that explodes in your mouth. Right. So don't do that one. Jacob's trying to get that one to work still. 
someday. OAuth two, right, Jacob? I uh, yeah, no, I just haven't come back to it yet. That's all. It didn't work in version one. Yeah, we had we had issues with it. They put out a blog post, I think, this week actually. Um, that I, is the that was the documentation that we were waiting on for how their OAuth setup is supposed to work. Um, and they've yeah, there you go. They've got screenshots and all that stuff. So which that's what I was hoping for because um, there's there's something we're doing wrong. There's something their code expects. I I don't know whatever. But um, once we get that ironed out, we'll be able to do that stuff, which will be slick. Um, and then you'll be able to do native send send via SMTP, but like with OAuth through FileMaker, which will be slick. So that'd be nice. All right, that's it, folks. I'll see you Monday. Appreciate it. Filemaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the Filemaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir!